Welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to discuss human papillomaviruses and cervical cancer. So, let me give you an overview of what we're going to discuss in this video, uh, well, the topics we're going to discuss and the order we're going to discuss them in. So, we're going to start off with background, anatomy, histology, and physiology of the cervix. So, we'll start with the anatomy of the cervix, then we'll discuss the histology of the epithelia which line the cervix. So we'll discuss the fact that there is a columnar epithelium lining the endocervical canal and a squamous stratified epithelium lining the ectocervix. We'll then discuss the metaplasia that occurs as a normal physiological process at the squamocolumnar junction following puberty, uh, because it's very important that we have a good understanding of that metaplasia process uh, in order to later justify why the cervix is so vulnerable to HPV infection. So that's the background anatomy, histology and physiology that we'll discuss right at the start. Then we'll move on to the pathology. So uh, to begin with, I will go over the neoplasia process because I want to make sure everyone understands that crucial bit of theory. We will discuss how does a normal cell turn into a cancerous cell. We will discuss the hallmarks of cancer. We'll discuss the microevolutionary process that occurs to turn a normal cell into a cancerous cell or how a normal cell can give rise to cancerous cells, I should say. Right. Then what we'll discuss is specifically cervical cancer. We'll see that there are three major types of cervical cancer, namely squamous cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma, and neuroendocrine tumours. After that point, we will focus all our attention on squamous cell carcinomas because they are the ones that are best understood and they are the ones that we think it is necessary for HPV infection to occur for you to actually get a squamous cell carcinoma. The other two types, adenocarcinoma and neuroendocrine tumours of the cervix, they are much rarer and it seems as though you can get them even without HPV infection. HPV infection does hugely increase your risk of getting them, but it doesn't seem to be necessary for you to get them. You can get them without ever having an HPV infection. And it's not really understood quite how HPV puts an increased risk of a person developing adenocarcinoma or neuroendocrine tumours. So we will focus all our attention on squamous cell carcinoma. Okay, then what we will do is introduce the human papillomaviruses. We'll have a look at their structure and then we'll have a look at their life cycle. And we'll spend a huge amount of time going over their life cycle because it is really important to know about the life cycle of the human papillomavirus to understand why they can give rise to cervical cancer. Once we've gone over the life cycle, we'll then actually spell out why can this actually lead to cervical cancer arising if you get a human papillomavirus infection in the squamous stratified epithelium. Finally, we'll go over the screening process for squamous cell carcinoma, which is the Papa Nicolau uh, screening test. Uh, and we'll also talk about the great success story of modern time, uh, which is vaccinations against human papillomavirus. We are now vaccinating young girls against the major forms of human papillomavirus, which can lead to squamous cell carcinoma. And we hope that this will lead to the annihilation of squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix. It won't lead to the annihilation of all cervical cancer, because as I say, there are also adenocarcinomas and neuroendocrine tumours, which it doesn't seem to be necessary for you to have an HPV infection to get, uh, but it will lead to a huge reduction because squamous cell carcinoma is the major form of cervical cancer. Okay, so I hope you're all excited about the video now. Let's actually begin. So, we are going to begin with the background anatomy, histology and physiology of the cervix. So we're going to begin with a little bit of anatomy, and I'm sure you have all seen this picture before. I'm going to draw the basic picture of the female reproductive tract. And the bit that, of course, that we are going to focus on is the cervix. I'm going to draw the uterus and a little bit of the fallopian tubes and the vagina as well. Um, but the bit that we're going to be interested in is the cervix. I'm just drawing all the other bits just to put it in context. So bear with me whilst I draw this then. So we'll start with the top of the uterus here. I think that's a good place to start. And then here is the side wall of the uterus. Here is another side wall of the uterus, and then the cervix is the bottommost 
portion of the uterus here, like so, and I wish it had managed to connect up a bit better, like so. Okay, um, so now um, let me give these walls a thickness. So I'll make this wall here have a thickness. I'll make this wall as well have a thickness. And here we're now having the wall of the cervix having a thickness. And the same over here. And then the fallopian tubes would come off here, of course. So I'll just put a little bit of the fallopian tubes on. So there's one of the fallopian tubes. That's, of course, we're imagining we're looking from the front. So that one would be the left fallopian tube, the start of it, in a way. Here, then, is the right fallopian tube. OK, so there we go. Um, and then let's draw the top part of the vagina on here. So we know, of course, that the cervix extends into the top part of the vagina. And there is this little sort of moat around the top of the cervix, or well, the bottom of the cervix, rather, uh, called the fornix. So now let's give this all a thickness, like so. So I apologise for the bad picture, but I hope that it uh, gets the basic structures across. So now let's just label this up. So we'll start up here. These are the fallopian tubes, which of course lead to the ovaries, or lead from the ovaries to the uterus. So this is the left fallopian tube, and this of course is the right fallopian tube over here. A new colour, let's have green. This portion here, of course, this is the uterus, or uh, the womb. And don't worry, the um, video will get a little bit more advanced than this later on. Uh, I just want the basics to be absolutely clear. Um, and, you know, I'm drawing these other bits to put the cervix in context. Don't worry, we will uh, spell out the anatomy of the cervix, and uh, that's the important bit that you'll obviously learn something in. Um, I'm not meaning to patronise anyone here. OK, so uh, then down here in blue... This portion here is the bit that we're really interested in. This is the cervix. And let me now give you a little bit of terminology for the different portions of the cervix. So, um, we have an entrance to the cervix from the vagina down here, and we have an exit from the cervix into the uterus over there. And these have names. These are called the external Oz and the internal Oz. So, the one down here leading from the vagina into the canal through the cervix, which is known as the endocervical canal, but I'll write down that later on. Uh, this is called the external os. So this is the external os. And then this one up here, the junction between the cervix or the endocervical canal and then the uh, uterus, uh, this of course is the internal os. So there's a little bit of terminology regarding the cervix. Then I've also given you another piece of terminology there, which is the name for that canal through the middle of the cervix here. So all of this bit that I'm now colouring in through green, which is bounded externally by the external os and internally by the internal os, that's called the endocervical canal. So this is the endocervical canal. Oh, and I should say... I will pronounce this cervical, but of course many people pronounce it cervical. Cervical, cervical, they're the same thing. Uh, so just two different pronunciations of the same thing. I will use cervical throughout this video just because I don't know where I got it from, but I find it difficult to change the way I pronounce something for ages. But if you want to pronounce it cervical, feel free to do so. Okay, so that's the endocervical canal. Uh, more uh, terms then. So down here, we have the top portion of the vagina here. This, is, of course, is not the full vagina. It will go on um, much further down. And um, this sort of moat that goes all the way around this portion of the cervix, which is exposed to the uh, vaginal cavity, uh, which is called the ectocervix, this moat is called the fornix, and then you'll see what I mean by describing it as a moat when I draw it from a different angle. So let's now imagine that we are looking from this angle up at the ectocervix, and I'll write that piece of terminology down first. So this 
portion of the cervix we've said is called the endocervical canal. This portion of the cervix which is exposed into the vaginal cavity, uh, this bit's called the ectocervix. And it's this portion that is going to develop squamous cell carcinoma, which is the major form of cancer of the cervix that we are going to study in huge detail in this video. So we're going to be very interested in this portion of the cervix. And although I've sort of separated ecto and cervix there, it should just be one word. So it's ecto cervix, one great big word. So that is the name for all of this bit here. This is the lining of the endocervical canal, this is the lining of the ectocervix portion, and then this is the wall of the vagina here. Okay, so we're now going to draw a picture as though we're uh, in the vagina and looking at the um, cervix, the ectocervix, and what you'll see is something along this line, lines of this. So here is the ectocervix, and then you'll have the endocervical canal, or the external os into the endocervical canal here, and it's a circle shaped, and then this is the sort of little um, space, the moat that goes around this, so this is like uh, a bulge outwards, and then there's a moat around the outside, and that's called the fornix. So this space here, and of course here, this is actually a uh, annulus that goes all the way around, and this is called the fornix. So this is the fornix. Okay, and I think that's as in detail as I want to go with the anatomy. So let's now turn on to histology. So there are two epithelia which line the cervix. There is the epithelium which lines the ectocervix, and then there is the epithelium which lines the endocervix. And they're very different types of epithelium. The ectocervix epithelium is the squamous stratified epithelium, whereas the endocervical canal epithelium, that's a columnar epithelium. And cancer in that type of epithelium is the adenocarcinomas of the cervix, but we'll come on to that later on when we come on to the pathology. For now, let me just describe the histology. So I'm going to begin actually with the histology of the uh, endocervical canal portion of the cervix. So what I want you to imagine that I'm going to do, and I'll just get another colour to do this, is we're going to chop through a little portion of the cervix here, and we're now going to zoom in on this big time. So I'm going to draw a much zoomed in picture of that over here. We'll have a look at the lining of this and all the layers of the wall of this histologically. So we'll just come over here to do this. In fact, I'll stay on the same level, we'll go here. Okay, so let's now have a look at the wall structure. So we'll begin with the epithelium that lines the endocervical canal. So this can be the tip of that epithelium here. And for reasons that I'll explain in a moment, I'm just gonna have a little invagination here, like so. Okay, so just to orient you, let me cover this in in green here. So this is the endocervical canal that we discussed earlier and which I uh, covered in green on our larger picture. Now what I want to show you is the epithelial cells lining the endocervical canal and these are going to be the tips of them here. So here we go. And they are columnar epithelial cells and this means they're very, very tall. Okay, so let me now split this up into separate cells. So here's one cell, here's another cell, another cell, another cell, and etc. I will just finish this off, so just bear with me. So here they all are. And columnar cells, ideally, I know some of them don't have these proportions, but ideally they should have a height four times their width. So this height here should be four times their width. It should be four times this amount. So this should be four times longer than this. That's what a columnar cell generally looks like. And they'll have nuclei, of course. I won't give every single one of them a nucleus. I'll just give those ones nuclei. Okay, so these are the columnar cells. So the epithelium which lines the endocervical canal is a columnar epithelium. And all of these columnar epithelial cells will be sat on a basement membrane. So I'll just have them sat on a basement membrane, which I'll draw in red here. So in red, this is representing the basement membrane that all of these 
columnar cells are sat on. And remember, the basement membrane is the thing that gives them structural integrity. It's the thing that gives the epithelium structural integrity. It is a protein meshwork that all of the epithelial cells, in this case columnar epithelial cells, are going to be sat on. Okay, and that's the reason they don't just fall off into the endocervical canal because they are attached to this basement membrane. So I'll label that up, go back to the small pen. So here in red, this is the basement membrane. Okay, so there's the epithelium then. Now let's go on to the layers underneath the epithelium and we'll discuss why I've put an invagination of the epithelium inwards. So what then is underneath the epithelium of the endocervical canal? Well, underneath that you have a stromal connective tissue layer, which I think I'll do in this funny little yellow colour that I have here. So, all of this layer here then, this is a layer called the stroma. So underneath the epithelium, you have a stromal layer. And this is just a connective tissue layer, so it consists of loads of connective tissue fibres. It will also have vasculature in there. So, you know, you'll have capillaries, terminal arterioles splitting into the capillaries, and then the capillaries will regroup into um, post-capillary venules. So you'll have all the microvasculature blood vessels, which will be nourishing uh, the columnar epithelial cells here. And overall, it's just a connective tissue supporting layer for the epithelium. Now let's come on to this invagination. This invagination is invaginating into the stroma and you have a lot of these along the endocervical canal. So coming back to our big picture here, along this you'll have loads of these little invaginations coming inwards and I might just draw a few of them in green here. So you'll have little invaginations of the endocervical canal inwards that are going into the stroma. And these are actually glands. So the thing I haven't told you yet is that these columnar epithelial cells that line the endocervical canal, they are going to be releasing mucus. And the reason that we have these invaginations inwards is just to increase the surface area of columnar epithelial cells so that we can produce more mucus. So these are just specialised structures for producing mucus. So on the surface then of the columnar epithelial cells, you will have a mucus layer, which I'll do in green. And you now understand why I drew the endocycle canal in green. So here we are, this is mucus, and this is secreted by the columnar epithelial cells. So they'll create mucus, they'll package it into vesicles, and then they'll exocytose those vesicles onto their apical surface to dump the mucus on their surface. Okay, so you have a mucus layer over the columnar epithelial cells of the endocervical canal. And you have these invaginations into the underlying stroma connective tissue layer, which are just to increase the surface area of the columnar epithelial cells so that we can produce more mucus. So these are glands, effectively, these invaginations. Okay, but do understand that these columnar epithelial cells up here on the actual surface, they're exactly the same as the ones down here. They're capable of producing the mucus as well. This is just an extension of the surface area so we can produce more mucus. Okay, so what's the layer then underneath the stroma? Underneath the stroma, you have a great big muscle layer, which is going to be a bit out of proportion here because I'm running out of space, uh, but should be much thicker than this. But I will draw it just as this, okay? So you have a muscle layer here in red. And as I say, it should be much thicker. I'm drawing this out of proportion. The stroma should not, in reality, be twice as thick as the muscle layer. The muscle layer is very, very thick. Um, but because I'm running out of space, this will have to do. Okay, so this is the muscle layer around the outside of the cervix. Okay, so that is the wall structure of the cervix, uh, well, the endocervical canal portion of the cervix. On the inner portion, and I'll just go back to my other picture, so here we are, lining the endocervical canal, you have the columnar epithelium, and this columnar epithelium is continuous with the columnar epithelium that lines the um, inside of the uterus. And then underneath that, you have the stroma, the connective tissue support layer, and then around that, you have a muscle cell layer smooth muscle cell layer. Okay, I should add that on. So this is um, smooth muscle, not skeletal muscle. 
Okay, right, so that's the structure of the portion of the cervix um, in that is um, around the endocervical canal. Let's now come to the structure of the ectocervix here. Now, the structure of the ectocervix is very similar. Again, right at the outside, you'll have the muscle layer. So, around the outside, you'll have a muscle layer. Underneath that, coming more towards the lumen here, you'll have a stromal connective tissue layer, and then you'll have an epithelium sitting on top of it. So very, very similar to this, it's just that the type of epithelium is completely different now. It's no longer a columnar epithelium, instead it's going to be a squamous stratified epithelium. And that means that there is going to be a junction between the columnar epithelium and the squamous stratified epithelium, which prior to puberty is at the external os here and that's called the squamocolumna junction, but we'll come back to that later on. For now, uh, let's try and draw the um, squamous stratified epithelium. And in fact, actually, I might try to ha draw it as an extension of this. So actually, I might show the uh, squamocolumna junction much sooner. So let's, in fact, try and do this. So let's extend this on. So here is the basement membrane here in red. And it's going to extend on, and let's say now we're coming on to the ectocervix here. So this would be the external os here, and this is now the basement membrane of the epithelium of the ectocervix. So just extending the stroma and muscle layer as well. Whoops, let me go to a thin pen. So here in yellow, this is the stroma coming around, so all of this is stroma, and I'm sorry about the annotation of the smooth muscle cell there, but never mind. Uh, and then you'll have the continuation of the smooth muscle cell there around as well, like so. So we're continuing the picture on nicely. I hope you're oriented to what I'm showing here. So, right up to the external os then, we're drawing the cervix prior to puberty at the moment. We'll discuss what happens after puberty and the metaplasia in a moment. For now, let's imagine that the squamocolumnar junction is going to be at the external os. So up to the external os, so all along here, we'll have to have a columnar epithelium. So let's start by drawing that. So back to the thin pen. So here, these are all going to be columnar epithelial cells, which of course will have a mucus lining. So here are the columnar epithelial cells, and let me put the mucus on top of them, in green again, like so. And then, now that we come on to the ectocervix portion, we're now going to have a squamous stratified epithelium. So let me firstly just write out the massive great name of this epithelium, and then we'll actually draw a picture of it. So it has an even longer name, actually, than just being a squamous stratified epithelium. It is actually going to be a non... Oh, damn. Let me just get the thinner pen. It's going to be a non-keratinized squamous stratified epithelium. And don't worry, I will justify what is meant by all of these different words. Non-keratinized squamous we'll see that the outer cell there, the outer layer of cells, are going to be squamous cells. They're going to be flat cells, that's what squamous means. Stratified means that it's got multiple layers of cells. So we saw that this columnar epithelium here, this only had a single layer of cells, and in fact we could have given the columnar epithelium an even larger title. We could have put the word simple columnar epithelium. So when you talk about a simple epithelium, that's an epithelium that has only one layer of cells. So in this case, this is a simple columnar epithelium that lines the endocervical canal because it's one layer of cells, that's the simple, that those cells are columnar cells, and of course it's an epithelium. Here we're going completely different. We're going to have squamous cells we're going to have a stratified epithelium, which means it's going to have multiple cell layers piled on top of each other. The squamous refers to the type of cell that is on the outermost layer. As we'll see, all of the cells in this stratified epithelium are not going to be squamous cells, so this refers to the outer layer of cells. And of course it's then an epithelium, so last word. Epithelium. I will justify the non-keratinized later on. That refers to the fact that this epithelium, although it has similarities to the epidermis, which is the outer layer of the skin, 
it's different to the epidermis. The epidermis is a keratinized squamous stratified epithelium, whereas this is a non-keratinized squamous stratified epithelium. We'll go over the epidermis later on when we come on to discuss human papillomaviruses, because there are some human papillomaviruses that uh, do infect the skin rather than uh, mucosal squamous stratified epithelia, such as the uh, ectocervix lining. Okay, so let's now actually draw this. So this is going to have multiple layers of cells. So <laughs> this is the complicated bit. Loads of histologists have come up with loads of different classifications of the different layers of cells in a squamous stratified epithelium. So if you go and, you know, type in on Google, squamous stratified epithelium layers, you'll get loads of different pictures and they'll all have different labellings for the different layers of the squamous stratified epithelium. And some of them have really old names that are evidently derived from Latin and are really pretentious. Some of them have newer names and are sort of newer modifications of that. We are going to go for a really, really simple classification of the different layers of the squamous stratified epithelium. We're just going to split it into three different layers. A basal cell layer, the mid zone, which consists of multiple layers, and then the superficial zone, which consists of multiple layers. As I say, there are much more complicated classifications for the layers of squamous stratified epithelia than this one. Uh, however, we don't need them. We can just make do with this really simple classification. So that's the one I'm going to use. So, as I say, this simple classification splits it into three different layers. And I'm just deciding which colour to now use. We'll use this colour here. So, we're going to have a basal cell layer, and that's the first layer. And this is just a single layer of cells. And as the name suggests, this is going to be the most basal layer. So this is going to be the layer that's actually connected to the basement membrane that we've got there in red. So these are going to be cuboidal cells. They're not going to be as tall as the columnar cells. They're going to be much more, uh, well, much less extreme. The proportions are not going to be one compared to four. It's going to be much more uh, closer to being square, but not quite being square. They're still going to be taller than they are thick. So I'll draw these on here. So we'll go all the way over to here. So here they are. I'll just split them all up. So these, this is the basal cell layer of this squamous stratified epithelium. So this is the first layer. And I'll discuss what this layer is doing later on. So here are their nuclei. I won't give them all nuclei. So that's the basal cell layer. Now we're doing the next layer in our classification. However, this is not going to be a single layer of cells, this is going to be multiple different layers of cells. So the next layer up in our classification is just what we will call the mid-zone. Okay, and as I say, I'll say this again, if you go on Google you will find much more complicated classifications which break what I'm just calling the mid-zone into multiple different layers. However, we don't need to be bothered with that. So I'm doing it in green, which is kind of awkward because the green was the mucus, so I'm going to choose another colour. We'll go for purple, so ignore the colour coding of that word, we're going to have these cells in purple. So here's one of them, here's another one, here's another one. So as I say, there's multiple layers of these making up the mid-zone, like so. So I'll just keep doing this. So all of these are cells, so I'll put some of them with nuclei, like so. Uh, and it needs to continue on, ideally, for as far as possible. I'm not going to do this over the entire bit that I've drawn the basal cell there, as I'll just do this bit here at the squamo columnar junction here. So all of this in purple, this is the mid-zone, and I'll stop there, because otherwise it'll just take too much time. So all of them are having nuclei added in now. Okay, so all of this is the mid-zone, so you're getting the point, it's multiple stacks of cells, and I've tried to draw them as though they're all the same size. It hasn't really worked, but they should all be about the same size, they should all have the same size nucleus, okay? And in reality, you probably have more layers than just four, as I've drawn there, it would be closer to ten, maybe. Okay, so multiple layers of these mid-zone cells uh, stacked on top of one another. And that's the mid-zone. 
Okay, and what I hope I've communicated there is that they are getting bigger and more rounder than the basal cell layers. The basal cell layer was, you know, a beautiful little cuboid cell attached onto the basement membrane, whereas these ones are getting bigger and more blobby rather than um, in this nice sort of rectangular shape here. Okay, so the next layer up from that, which we'll do in um, this sort of pale green, is going to be um, the superficial layer. So next up we're going to have the superficial, and in fact I'll call it superficial zone rather than superficial layer, because again, just like the mid zone, it is not just one layer of cells, it's multiple layers of cells. And the superficial zone is where the cells are really starting to become squamous, they're starting to become flat. So let me now draw one of them on here. So here's one of the superficial zone cells there. Here's another superficial zone cell here. Here's another superficial zone cell. So they are flat. That is what the squamous means. It refers to these superficial cells that are now flat. And then as you go up further, you're going to have more of these piled on top of each other. And this makes up the superficial zone. And I'll put a few more layers on here quicker than before. So these are more of these superficial zone cells. So again, I've drawn four layers. In reality, you'll have a few more than that. Okay, so that is how we are going to classify the layers of a squamous stratified epithelium into these three simple layers, the basal cell layer, the mid zone, where the cells are becoming bigger, getting ready to turn into these squamous cells, uh, and then the superficial zone, which is actually where the cells are big and flat, very, very flat, and they're you know, they're the origin of the name of the epithelium being called a squamous epithelium. Okay, so let me just explain a little bit about how this epithelium works. Actually, before I do that, let me just say that this point, in case you hadn't realised, this is the junction between the squamous stratified epithelium and then the columnar epithelium. And this is what we call the squamo-columnar junction, or the SCG for short. So this is the squamo, columnar, and I'll just go along a little bit here. This, so this is the squamo, columnar junction. Okay, um, and we'll talk more about the physiology of that in just a moment. So, now coming back to the physiology of the squamous stratified epithelium. So, this epithelium is continuously shedding, just like the skin. Everyone knows that the skin is continuously shedding. The most superficial cells, so this most superficial layer of cells, these will shed off, they'll break off, and they'll go. And that means that you have to continuously rebuild the layers. So what is happening is these cells in the basal cell layers, these are actually stem cells. So uh, a very famous type of cell. So these are stem cells. And that means that they can divide, and when they divide, one of the daughter cells will remain a stem cell and will remain as a basal cell, it will remain attached to the basement membrane, and the other cell that's produced, it will move on and differentiate and change. So let me just draw a little um, picture of this. So if this is one of my basal cells here, what will happen is it will divide into two daughter cells, and this is happening continuously. So one of the daughter cells will remain as a basal cell, it will remain as a stem cell. The other one will move up into the mid zone, okay? So it produces two progeny that are very different. One that does exactly what it's done and replaces it, and the other that is going to differentiate. So this one here, is going to differentiate. So these are the cells that, you know, from which the entire epithelium stems, hence their name. So this one is going to differentiate. Okay, um, so it will become more specialised. And now that it begins the differentiation process, and this differentiation process is the process that will turn it into one of these squamous uh, cells right at the top here that will be shedded off. Um, once it begins that differentiation process, it can no longer divide. So only the stem cells in the basal cell layer can divide. The ones that they've produced that are in layers above them, those cannot divide. None of these cells are dividing. 
And that, as we will see, is the huge thing that the human papillomavirus changes and which makes it so dangerous and which allows it to give rise to cancer in this uh, squamous stratified epithelium of the ectocervix. Okay, so... Uh, what will happen then is gradually this cell will go through this differentiation process and it will move up the different layers. So it will gradually move up through the midzone and then it will gradually become more and more squamous and then it will go into the superficial zone and then gradually it will reach the outside and then it will be shedded away. And the basal cells are continuously dividing and producing new cells that can go through this process so that we're continually replacing the outer layer of cells that are being shedded away, and that is the physiology of a squamous stratified epithelium. So now coming on to this non-keratinized, which I promised I would justify. So there are lots of different squamous stratified epithelia in the body. We will talk about them all later on because the human papillomaviruses can infect all of them. Well, different, there are different types of human papillomaviruses and different ones of them affect different squamous stratified epithelia. So we will discuss all the different types later on. For now, let me say that there are two major types of squamous stratified epithelium. We can split all squamous stratified epithelia into two major types, keratinized and non-keratinized. And the epidermis of the skin is a keratinized squamous stratified epithelium. All of the other ones are non-keratinized squamous stratified epithelium. This is a non-keratinized squamous stratified epithelium. And what this means is that as the cells go through the differentiation process and become these squamous cells at the top, they do not fill with keratin. If we were talking about the epidermis, if this was the picture I was drawing for the epidermis, and I could draw a very similar picture for the epidermis that surrounds the skin, these cells would become full of keratin, absolutely full full of keratin, okay? And that's where, uh, keratin of course is a protein, a, a, a structural protein inside the cells. It's really important in the cytoskeleton of cells, which is the structure that gives cells their shape. So remember, once upon a time when we were young children learning about cells in school, we just drew cells like this. And in fact, I've just drawn cells like this on all of my pictures, but never mind, we just drew cells like this. We had a cell membrane, and we drew a nucleus like this, and then there was the cytoplasm in between. Uh, in reality, the cytoplasm is not just a bunch of gloop. In reality, it's absolutely filled with a meshwork of fibres, protein fibres and carbohydrate fibres like so. So in reality, it looks like this. These are all these fibres, and they're all interconnected, and they're all very rigid. And this is why a cell maintains its shape. If the cytoplasm was just gloop, then a cell would continuously be changing its shape. What means that a cell stays in the same shape is that it has this rigid protein and carbohydrate fibre meshwork inside it. And that, of course, is called the cytoskeleton. Keratin is a component of the cytoskeleton. Now, if we're talking about the squamous stratified epithelium of the skin, the squamous cells become absolutely overloaded in keratin and they also lose their nuclei. So this picture isn't correct for the squamous stratified epithelium of the skin. To make it correct, I'd have to have these outer layer cells in the superficial zone have, having no nuclei. I wouldn't make all of the cells in the superficial zone lacking nuclei, just the most superficial layers. Maybe the two most superficial layers, they would not have nuclei. They'd be absolutely overloaded in keratin and they'd have lost their nuclei. So that's the difference between keratinized squamous stratified epithelia and non-keratinized squamous stratified epithelia. We can classify all squamous stratified epithelia into these three different layers, but in the keratinized ones, the superficial zone, the most superficial layers of the superficial zone, so let's say the two outermost layers in this picture, would be absolutely overloaded with keratin and they'd have lost their nuclei. Whereas we're talking about a non-keratinized one, so they're not absolutely overloaded with the cytoskeletal component keratin and they still have their nuclei. Okay. So, that's enough about um, non-keratinized squamous stratified epithelia. We will come back to discussing squamous stratified epithelia later on once we're on to the pathology part and we're discussing human papillomaviruses. But for now, that's enough. Okay, so, the thing that I now want to discuss is the metaplasia. 
this is something that a lot of people misunderstand. They think that the metaplasia is part of the cancer process, whereas it's not. It's part of the normal physiology of the cervix. I just want to make sure everyone understands this. Okay, so we're going to talk about cervical metaplasia. This is not pathology. Metaplasia, everyone instantly thinks, my goodness, this is something to do with cancer. This is a normal physiological process that unfortunately makes the cervix incredibly susceptible to HPV infection. Okay, so let me tell you the story of how this occurs. So, in a girl prior to puberty, the squamocolumnar junction is just where I have drawn it. It is at the external os, the gap between the endocervical canal and then the vaginal cavity. And this is a perfect place for the squamocolumnar junction to be because it means that this really thick layer of cells is exposed to the vaginal cavity and this simple epithelium, this columnar simple epithelium, is not. Now, the vaginal cavity is quite acidic, it's not a nice environment, and it has to be acidic to keep itself sterile, to try and stop horrible bacteria and other pathogens growing there, okay? The squamous stratified epithelium can, it can cope with the acidic conditions because, of course, the basal cells, which are the really important ones to maintain, they are protected by all of these cells that are being shedded anyway. So it really doesn't matter about these superficial cells getting burnt by the acid, or damaged by the acid, I should say, because they're going to be shed anyway and they're not going to remain as part of the body. And the basal cells aren't going to be harmed by it, which are the important cells that you need to maintain there. They're not going to be harmed by it because they're protected by all of these more superficial layers. Okay, so the squamous stratified epithelium can cope with the acidic environment. I'm just going to put a little note here that the vaginal environment is acidic. Okay, so this can cope with the acidic environment, but do we think that the columnar epithelium, the simple columnar epithelium, would be able to cope with the acidic environment? The answer is no, it won't like it because those cells will actually get damaged because there's only one layer of cells. Luckily, in pre-puberty stage, it's not going to be exposed to the acidic environment, so it's not a problem at all because it's inside the endocervical canal. Okay, so what happens at puberty is the cervix grows. And let me try and demonstrate this on my picture over here. So if you imagine the cervix growing, what actually ends up happening is imagine this engorging. You can imagine that the squamocolumnar junction might actually end up moving. Imagine the whole thing sort of, um, I don't know how to, wait, uh, how to explain it. Imagine the whole thing getting bigger. You can imagine that this might actually lead to the squamocolumnar junction moving and it does actually lead to it moving. Imagine the whole thing getting bigger and the whole epithelium sort of moving along the along because the whole thing is getting bigger. So imagine this bit getting bigger It'll sort of push the epithelium forward. I hope that your visualization abilities are able to comprehend that if the thing, if the cervix was to grow, the squamocolumnar junction might end up moving, and that's exactly what happens. And unfortunately, what happens is the squamocolumnar junction ends up moving outward, so that the columnar epithelial cells end up exposed to the vaginal environment. So, trying to draw this on this picture. What happens at puberty due to the growth of the cervix is this squamocolumnar junction moves like this. So this is at puberty that this is going to occur. And this means now that these sim that this simple columnar epithelium is going to be exposed to the acidic um, environment of the vagina. And this leads to the process of cervical metaplasia. It leads to the um, simple columnar epithelial cells that are now exposed to the vaginal environment. And I might just actually try and draw a little picture of this. So bear with me whilst I draw a picture of this. So we'll go back to the red pen. So I'm drawing the exact same picture, but now after puberty. So here is that basement membrane. And now we're going to have the columnar epithelial cells like this. So they will now be exposed to the vaginal cavity. And I won't attempt to draw the uh, squamous stratified epithelium, but it will be here now. So here 
is the new position of the squamo columnar junction. Okay, so there we go. So what's now going to happen is this columnar epithelium that we have here is actually going to turn into a squamous stratified epithelium, and this is what is meant by cervical metaplasia, and this is a perfectly physiological process that will occur in all women after puberty. So what does metaplasia actually mean? Metaplasia means change in tissue type. So it refers to the fact that the simple columnar epithelium is going to become a squamous stratified epithelium. So change in tissue type is what's going to occur. And this is cervical metaplasia. So we're going to go from being a simple columnar epithelium to being a squamous stratified epithelium. And this is an incredibly slow process. It begins after puberty has occurred and the cervix has grown and the squamocolumnar junction has moved so that it's no longer at the external os, but it's instead um, exposed to the vaginal environment. And in fact, I can draw it on this picture. So remember, here we have what the ectocervix looks like from within the vagina. Um, what will now happen is the squamocolumnar junction will be at this sort of position now. So all of this will be columnar epithelium, and this now will be the squamous stratified epithelium. So all of this columnar epithelium that's exposed to the vaginal canal, and of course not the columnar epithelium that's still lining the endocervical canal, that's fine. Just the bit that's exposed to the vaginal canal, that's going to undergo this metaplastic process to turn into a squamous stratified epithelium. And this is what we refer to as cervical metaplasia. So what actually happens well, it's a really slow process but, but that isn't particularly well understood. But what happens is a certain type of cell known as a subcolumnar cell begins to emerge amongst the columnar epithelial cells. And I've drawn these columnar epithelial cells a bit out of proportion. I mean, I haven't really got them being four times the height that they are width. But imagine that they're... In fact, I could actually try and draw it. I'm going to extend them up give them a higher boundary, so really their topmost boundary should be up here so that they actually have the right proportions, like so. Okay, so there we have our taller squamous, uh, sorry, uh, columnar cells. So I'll turn this line in the middle into their nuclei, like so. So what's now going to emerge amongst the columnar epithelial cells, we're going to now get these cells called subcolumnar cells, and it really is not understood where these subcolumnar cells actually come from, but they do emerge. And these will be much smaller cells that will sort of sit in between the columnar epithelial cells. And the reason they're called subcolumnar is that they are not really exposed to the vaginal um, environment because they're not underneath the columnar cells but they're much less tall than the columnar epithelial cells so the columnar epithelial cells surround their top effectively but they are again attached to the basement membrane here so you get the emergence of these subcolumnar epithelial cells and gradually the columnar epithelial cells they go away and these subcolumnar epithelial cells these will become the basal cells the stem cells of the squamous stratified epithelium so these become the stem cells, and therefore they begin dividing, and they start producing layers of cells on top of them. So they start producing a squamous stratified epithelium. So let me summarise that. What will start to happen when the columnar epithelium is exposed to the acidic environment of the vagina, uh, the process of metaplasia begins. And this begins with these columnar cells, and let me just... Um, Okay, um, I'm just receiving a warning about battery being low. Sorry about that. Uh, we'll be through with this video in a moment. Okay, so um, when uh, the um, metaplasia begins, the subcolumnar cells emerge in between the columnar epithelial cells. And gradually the columnar epithelial cells will atrophy away. They all disappear and these subcolumnar cells will become the stem cells of the squamous stratified epithelium. They'll start dividing and producing layers above them and that's how the um, columnar epithelium can turn into being a squamous stratified epithelium. And this process will begin at the most peripheral portions closest to the, sub uh, to the squamo columnar junction and work its way inwards. So what I mean by that is going back to this picture up here. 
it'll begin around the edge here. So the columnar cells right around the edge will undergo the metaplasia process first, and then it will gradually move inwards. So gradually, over years and years and years, and you have to understand this is a really slow process. It occurs over decades. So it's not a fast process at all. It's over decades. So following puberty for decades and decades afterwards, the metaplasia process is going onwards. And gradually, as you approach menopause, the squamocolumnar junction moves inwards and inwards and inwards back to being at the external os. So by the time a woman reaches menopause, the squamocolumnar junction is back where it was prior to puberty. Uh, it's back at the external os, and the reason is that the columnar epithelial cells that were exposed to the vaginal environment following puberty have gradually undergone the metaplasia process and have now created these squamous stratified epithelia. So that is what is meant by cervical metaplasia, the gradual convergence of the squamocolumnar junction inwards because the columnar epithelium is gradually turning into a squamous stratified epithelium. And I want you to understand that process because later on it will be important for justifying why uh, the cervix is so vulnerable to HPV infection. But for now, I'll leave it there. Okay, so we'll have a break here. We have now completed all the background physiology and anatomy. In the next video, we will discuss pathology. We will go over a really important theory, which is the theory of where does cancer come from.